If you would like my dad's videos, please subscribe to QA Insights channel. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, Clubhouse session. So this is our 10th uh, uh, Clubhouse meeting uh, featuring uh, uh, Chaos Engineering uh, by Karthik. So thank you for everyone. Uh, so till now we have around 350 members uh, in this uh, Clubhouse. And this session is being uh, recorded. Uh, so I'm using an application called Backstage. So it will be uh, recording everything, including the transcription and other details. So I will be posting this link in the uh, my YouTube channel and also in GitHub repository also you can uh, check it out. So this session, uh, so I'm going to divide into multiple sections basically, uh, 10 to 15 minutes segments. And then I will try to keep it within one hour. And uh, for every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, we can uh, take around two to three questions and then Karthik will be answering that. Uh, we are not uh, limiting the number of questions. Just to proceed the sessions further, uh, we are making this kind of arrangement. But you can, anytime you can ask any questions uh, to Karthik and Karthik will be very happy to uh, answer your question. So now uh, let us begin. So let me give you a quick introduction, uh, Karthik. So Karthik is a CTO of Chaos Native. So Chaos Native is a, a Chaos Engineering solution. Uh, uh, they have a couple of products, Litmus and uh, you can check it out their website and let us go uh, over to Karthik. Hi, Karthik. Hi, Naveen. Hi. Th Hi thank everyone. you for uh, joining us. So we are very excited to listen uh, about uh, evolution of chaos testing and engineering. So over to you. Yeah, my pleasure, uh, Naveen. At the outset, I'd like to thank you for um, reaching out and giving me this opportunity to come and talk about uh, chaos engineering. I'm uh, quite new to this uh, clubhouse experience, so I must say um, this is great. Trying to learn something new through all this. Thank you so much once again. I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself and uh, we can get started with the topic. So my name is Karthik. Um, I am one of the maintainers of the open source uh, chaos engineering project called Litmus Chaos. I think I have a fellow maintainer with me today. Um, in the audience, Raj. And um, I also happen to be the co-founder of an organization called Chaos Native, which is one of the prime sponsors of the Litmus Open Source Project, uh, amongst other organizations. So uh, really glad to come here and speak about uh, Chaos Engineering. Uh, to give you a little bit of um, history, we'll start with history and uh, We'll talk about what chaos engineering is, how it evolved. A lot of you here in the audience might already know what chaos engineering is. You might already be practitioners. You might be using different tools out there. Uh, some of you might not be practicing chaos engineering, knowing it is called chaos engineering. You might be doing it as failure testing, you might be calling it by a different name, but you might still be following it in principle. So chaos engineering is um, a discipline that was formally brought about about a decade or so back. I think Netflix, Netflix, um, Salesforce, Amazon, some of these organizations, um, which created some very good resiliency practices because they were actually providing uh, platforms or they continue to provide platforms that are consumed by millions of people. Resiliency is very key, of course, to all of us, but more so for those kind of services which are public facing, sometimes infrastructure software, important as it is, gives you a little bit of um, scope for uh, sort of fixing things. You can take some time, but uh, when it is uh, publicly consumed uh, software, let's say Netflix, you're streaming videos and thousands of users are doing it at the same point of time. You need to ensure that it is always available so organizations like those came up with this discipline called chaos engineering. They put together all their resilience practices. And one of them happened to be doing um, failure testing and doing failure testing in production and doing it in a particular way. Uh, that is why they did not call it failure testing. They called it as chaos engineering. Chaos engineering uh, sounds like a very interesting term. The first time I heard of it uh, was uh, three, four years back. I, I also did not know what chaos engineering was. 
So if you look at the principles of chaos.org, which is uh, the set of uh, principles or tenets that these organizations came up with, there is a single page of website backed by a GitHub repository. You, you'll see principles of chaos.org. They talk about what chaos engineering is. They define it as the discipline of experimenting on a system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. It's a fairly heavy wording uh, definition. Uh, let's think of it like this. Um, no, you, you all um, must have heard of Fastly, Cloudflare, some of these uh, big CDN um, providers. And recently, Fastly went down for an hour, and it took down several websites along with it. And um, there are people who lost a lot of money. Outages, when they happen, because a lot of uh, money, the, a lot of dollars are burnt. That is what people try to avoid. And um, the way they avoid is try and simulate those failures, different kinds of failures in production in a controlled way and see how the system responds. And then they go and build some mitigation within their uh, deployment practices or their infrastructure or application business logic and ensure that they can ensure the impact is not much. They know how to handle these kind of failures. They know how they can um, probably recover within the SLAs that they've promised to people. If you look at Azure and GCP and some of these uh, cloud providers, um, IaaS and SaaS platforms, they tell you something like 99.95 availability. You must have heard of this term, five nines, six nines, the, the availability percentages that uh, people promise as SLAs. In order to ensure that this is upheld, people go ahead and do some controlled failures and uh, see how the system behaves and actually plan on um, the right mitigation strategies. They ensure that failures that they observe don't turn into business outages. That is what chaos engineering is about. So going back to this term chaos engineering and the history about it, um, Netflix, uh, it is believed, uh, moved from using an on-premise data center into running everything on AWS after they faced um, uh, database corruption. And uh, they had an outage for three days. This was way back, maybe in 2008, 2009 time. And once they put everything on AWS, they just did not go to a more reliant platform and let it be. Um, they crafted a lot of um, tests uh, that uh, actually, uh, you know, verified whether their applications were resilient on AWS. A lot of those tests over a period of time took the shape of tools. Whatever was done manually as a practice turned into tools and frameworks. You must have heard of chaos monkey. That's when this term called chaos and chaos engineering sort of came into being, you can say about 10 years back. They created chaos monkey and a, a suit of other monkeys. The reason why they selected monkeys was, um, you know, how, how the monkey is, right? Um, very restless. It, it, it can basically cause a lot of havoc and uh, very unpredictable. So they created a chaos monkey. Initially, it took down EC2 instances. And uh, over a period of time, they created other monkeys, janitor monkey to clean up unused resources, security monkeys to verify um, uh, if they were in security loopholes, conformity monkeys to uh, verify if there was you know, policy violations, all these kind of things, right? And they made it um, a scientific discipline. They sort of um, took a lot of things from the ops world, uh, mean time to detection, mean time to recovery, and um, all the best practices associated with managing deployment environments or production environments, they took all of that into account. They brought about validation mechanisms for a lot of those things, created the tools to cause failures, and then even constructed the approaches and, of course, made them public to carry out these experiments. The way you need to carry out these chaos experiments was also sort of... Uh, created by them. 
they call it game days so game day is when a group of people get together mostly folks in the ops team and they bring the right support persona on board they get sign off from all the stakeholders sometimes they keep their customers involved and let them know what is going to happen then they go and file something in production uh, may, maybe they started small with uh, killing ec2 instances they moved on to taking down availability zones all sorts of things and um, they verified how the system behaved if there was an issue of course when they went ahead and did this game day they also had mitigation plans rollback plans ready if something did fail then this is what they would do to regain optimal operational characteristics within this much time so that is the idea they would go with have right observability infrastructure to be able to get a fine grained view of what's happening in the system when this failure is being carried out go with the proper hypothesis and uh, then their hypothesis would be proved or disproved most probably the hypothesis would be around how the slos would uh, whether they would continue to be maintained or if there was a deviation what is the extent of the deviation and whether this help feel worked etc there's a lot of things you would uh, anticipate happening when you do failures so they went with all that hypothesis and uh, they said this is how you do game days they constructed some templates uh, some of them are uh, available on the net today different people have customized it based on the kind of applications and services they provide they have their own version of game days and um, you can find a lot of material on the internet uh, especially by folks from amazon with uh, amazon prime and all these things how they carry out chaos engineering and how they maintain resilience etc so this is the whole practice of uh, chaos engineering um, the people from the ops and then the people from this group called the sres you might have heard of this word called sre site reliability engineering or site reliability engineers something that google popularized you must have seen the google sre book which is a very popular book uh, google crystallized all their um, best practices around how they manage uh, their production environments and then they wrote that in that book um one of the very interesting things that they mentioned was sres are not pure ops folks they are actually developers and um, they treat your uh, environments deployment environments as they would treat an app so everything that you would visualize uh, as being done to an app or the way you would visualize an app life cycle being constructed something similar happens to their deployment environments also right amongst uh, this big group of organizations that practiced and advocated chaos engineering google was one of them netflix amazon and um, salesforce and lot of these people and they brought in this uh, concept and later it became a designation and uh, you see a lot of sres today on linkedin the sres were the people uh, who carried out uh, chaos engineering and that's how it has been done for a long period of time many folks and um, in in organizations with multiple layers um uh, with different silos i think chaos engineering is a very very restricted esoteric practice that's uh, that's been uh, you know followed and implemented by a core group of people but not something that is accessible information wise or um, or as a as a you know activity to a lot of other people say developers testers qa engineers performance engineers and the like right it was being done by a close group uh, who would do it either on production or they would do it in environments that closely mimicked production maybe pre prod or staging environments as you would call them and um, this also was adopted by not too many organizations but by a few and um, the organizations that did it often had um, differences um, or uh, very subtle um, philosophical um, you know differences or departure from the qa methodology of testing failures as a qa or um, you know as a as a developer or as a qa engineer i'm sure a lot of people would be doing failures we have had a lot of things in the past system tests we would call them uh, we would call them as 
kitchen sink tests go and uh, remove the power plug go and uh, bounce a port on the switch or um, uh, you know just basically reboot a node this is not something new this also forms the core of what is done as part of chaos engineering as well but there are some subtle differences in the way a person would approach a chaos experiment as they would call it in chaos engineering versus a failure test in a qa environment for starters the environment in which these tests are conducted in qa are often very sanitized environments maybe clusters or uh, test beds brought up just for that purpose either manually or as part of uh, some ci cd pipeline some automation there is not much dynamic um um th- there is not much um dynamism or whatever you call associated with that environment it is generally very clean running workloads specific workloads and you go do the test you see the behavior a lot of times the focus is on the how how the application works in in qa whereas when you do chaos experiments it is often a setup that has been running for a long time used by multiple people with applications and services having gone upgrades for a long time running lot of load either this is production that i'm talking about or uh, staging environments that one would try to mimic and uh, keep very close to production so you have uh, things fester on for a long time give opportunity for failures to build up um a system utilization to sort of uh, go beyond a certain point and then you do chaos experiments there so there is a difference in the environment the test bed for one and then there's also the change in approach or what you're trying to look at so chaos engineering is a lot about the what rather than the how so you're not really interested in which a service is behaving exactly uh, which way or how it is doing that what is the underlying mechanism or functionality that's been written to you know sort of um, behave in a particular way rather you are interested in the end view um uh, that is expected out of your service uh by end view i'm talking about slos you might have heard of the terms slos and slis as performance engineers you're, you're all uh, i'm sure very familiar with these terminologies when um a service is uh, built or architected in response to a request for the service you come up with some sla service level agreements right and then those agreements are broken down into slos that probably correspond to individual pieces of the service the larger service that's being provided service in this case i'm talking about you can think of it as uh the service that is being provided the functionality that is being provided to an end user then that is broken down into several component services the actual technical pieces running on your infra and you have an slo against all of them and you have some service level indicators that tell you whether the slos are being met or no the slos are generally cut offs against some slis that you might have let us say you are supposed to be operating under 200 milliseconds latency uh, average latency so the average latency here is the sli and the 200 milliseconds is probably the cutoff and the slo contributing towards a larger sla which then translates into that 5969 of your you know, eventual platform or service so chaos engineering is a lot about monitoring those end goals not really looking at how the system is accomplishing it rather than whether it is able to accomplish the end point end goal so this is the slight differences between uh, failure testing and uh, uh, chaos experimentation mm-hmm. though you could use the same tool to accomplish either view it's about what purpose you go with um when you go ahead and do this failure you can make it a chaos experiment or you can it could just be a failure test run as part of your cicd pipelines so, so- and there's also another thing yeah I, i think there was a Kar- question yeah karthik yeah yeah i have a, a, one question so uh, chaos engineering right so where does it fit uh, will it fit in the shift right uh, methodology or uh, if it is a shift right uh, how can we move that to shift left it's it's an interesting question so uh, um as qa engineers or as as, as developers or as um, 
Now, performance engineers, we often hear this word shift left. Um, we made very popular with agile and uh, uh, scrum uh, and all these sprints and all these concepts. Uh, you would like to basically ensure that you're testing things earlier in the cycle. Uh, the moment you have something, some deliverable piece, not leave it towards the end um, as you would with the traditional waterfall model. So this is this shift left philosophy that we have. But chaos engineering sort of evolved out of a shift right uh, revolution. Um, there is um, a Twitter account called Copy Construct, uh, which I generally um, find great uh, um, fascination for. And um, it, it, it's it's backed by a person called Cindy Sridharan, who, who writes a lot about resiliency, etc. There's a very good shift right um, uh, uh, article that you might find there. I'll probably share the resources uh, after this call. So chaos engineering uh, sort of start started as a philosophy because of the shift right. So it said that nothing can come close to what happens in production. And um, the way your system responds to something failing on production is very different from how your system would behave when something failed in a very con sanitized environment with uh, not much load or not much... Um, dynamism, etc. So you basically need to, and the dependencies that you encounter in production are far more. Um, the for, for, for example, for starters, the infrastructure upon which you deploy your end services uh, often is very different from your test environments, test beds. So you really don't know what is going to happen until you inject that in production. So production is the farthest right that you would go. So chaos engineering started as a shift right philosophy. And that's how it has been for a long time. Uh, so to answer your question, Naveen, chaos engineering traditionally started with shift right. They said production or the environments closest to production is where you do chaos. But it's changing um, in the recent times. It's good that you brought this up. Uh, that serves as a lead for um, what we can talk about next. So there's this big... So I think I sort of um, gave an overview of what chaos engineering is and uh, why practicing it is important and where it is done, how it was brought in as a concept, how it differs from failure testing, things like that. Now that we've set the background for chaos testing and also said that shift right is where chaos engineering is done. Now let's talk about what has changed in chaos engineering in the last um, say two, three years. And that's where the shift left is coming in, and we'll talk why. So, yes, before I do that, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Kathy. Yeah, we can take a couple of questions, and then we can uh, move the uh, sure. topic. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Karthik, Naveen. Uh, hi, this is Sid. I have a basic question, like, uh, <clears throat> like I, one one of my questions is asked by Naveen, but uh, before that, I have few questions, like. Oh, my question is like, uh, where does performance engineers or test engineers fit into the chaos engineering? That is the mm -hmm. one. And, and as you mentioned, it's only meant for the SREs, which Google created. And the second question is, who are the decision makers or who are the product owners? Or who is a big person or architect? Who design or who give the targets? This kind of chaos testers. Now, chaos, chaos testing has to be done. And the third question is, there is no limit of, there is a, a test cases like kind of what chaos test or what you call chaos engineering use cases you can implement. So like that, in the, as a performance engineers, we may monitor a lot of, lot of counters, like like any level of counters in the, either it infra or OS level or anything. So every counter could be become like a test case in the chaos. So is that right? Is mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I do, ha I do have a fourth question, but uh, uh, like uh, so, <laughs> I'm already <laughs> losing uh, track of them. So I'll I'll oh, try that, I'll try to answer yeah, this. Just, that's fine. That's fine. Just you can go ahead with the uh, three questions. I'll ask the fourth question later. Okay. Sure, sure. So I think the first question was um, how does performance uh, testing fit in? Um, that's a great question, um, and I think very important considering. Uh, our um, target audience also. So performance testing, uh, performance 
evaluation during chaos is extremely important and uh, when you perform chaos or practice a chaos experiment you wouldn't uh, do that in um let's say when you're doing it in production you would not be running additional load to what is already there because um you expect the system is already under significant duress when the experiment is performed the fault injection is carried out but when chaos is done in uh, pre prod or staging environments that is where it becomes necessary for us to make the effort to simulate the kind of load that you would do in production and often times that happens using um, performance tools performance load generation tools there are um classic cases of uh, people using locust k6 vegeta a lot of such tools um in order to generate load on the system and uh, generate enough traffic uh, while the chaos experiment is performed now there are two aspects to this as performance engineers um like you said there are a lot of counters that you look at there are a lot of aspects of performance uh, performance of the system is characterized by like several parameters let us say there are hundreds of parameters um that you are looking at that describe your system's performance and um <clears throat> when you're doing chaos it it becomes necessary for you to um sort of look what is changing when you do this but um the load that you are generating can either be a very specific profile uh, that simulates uh, a user uh, condition um uh, user workload as they say which sometimes involves um i think there are some tpcc benchmarks and things like that which even simulate user delays user time uh, thinking time so you try to keep it as real world as possible when you go ahead and uh, do chaos engineering just to sort of simulate uh, conditions when you are trying to uh, prep for black friday for example there's an organization which is going to let's say flipkart or amazon uh, there's a sale coming up big billion day black friday things like that you, you you know the traffic is going to hit the roof so you are intent on stressing out the system to max possible your, your load generators are um, running those kind of profiles attuned to run that kind of load um so that is uh, uh one thing that happens usually and you monitor all those counters as the failures happen then the other way of looking at it is you also try and um, sort of sim- simulate the user traffic patterns maybe weekends nights um afternoons the, the, there's a specific uh, you know waxing and waning pattern of traffic that um, you anticipate and then you are using your uh, load generation tools uh, to sort of generate those profiles and when you do chaos so benchmarking and performance as i understand it i am not an expert but the way i understand it is you look for uh, specific workloads and look for um, you know how the system is behaving you do absolute and relative benchmarks um, under different kind of conditions uh, system in uh, all component working state system in a degraded mode etc etc that ties in very much with chaos though the kind of profiles that you would run during the course of the injection might really vary depending upon the intent behind the experiment so yeah performance tools um, really plays a big part in chaos experiment performance and benchmarking tools uh, load generators play a big uh, part in uh, chaos engineering and chaos experiments or fault injections um, may be used as part of a performance testing suite as well um, if you if you're trying to get what i'm saying as part of an experiment and as part of hypothesis you might be using the load generator as an aid but on the other hand if you are building a performance test suite uh, then you might use some chaos tool some fault injection platform let's say litmus or gremlin or or um, uh, chaos mesh or whatever it is to actually cause a fault in your system and um, sort of give you the right uh knowledge about how your system behaves under a specific workload um uh, with a certain failure so it, it they are very much hand in hand i would say the way in which the chaos tooling and performance benchmark tooling is 
utilized during the course of an experiment sort of decides uh, you know what is the inference that you try to derive i i hope that sort of answers uh, the question on os i'm sorry on uh, performance uh, uh, with chaos the other question was about uh, who makes a decision around uh, chaos engineering what tests should be done who should do it when it should be done what environment it should be done etc um that again is changing i think for a large part uh, of the decade it um, was adopted in mature organizations which had a well built resiliency practice it's so often the sres it's the let's say the head of uh, site reliability engineering or uh, some such persona would, would which would actually say that we need to sort of have the chaos practice and then you would actually expect the chaos um, uh, the site reliability engineers to come up with the chaos scenarios and then they do it in game days with all the right people involved so the decision uh, making uh, would probably be from their top down from the let's say hre sre head but um, off late it is changing it is becoming a little bit more bottoms up developers are also doing chaos engineering that's the part that we will talk about next this is the change that has happened in the last 2 3 years but before we go there i'd also like to point out how the general um, adoption pattern happens for chaos people don't want people are generally very apprehensive or hesitant to do chaos engineering because um if you are going to do chaos engineering it's you are implying that system could have some weaknesses nobody likes to admit to having weaknesses um so people are very hesitant about doing chaos engineering they leave it to the uh, application delivery teams the test and the development and performance engineering teams to say you please tell us the faults and give us the finished product we'll ensure it always runs and we monitor and we observe we do patches and upgrades if something goes wrong um we'll get back to you we'll raise a sev one and then uh, we will sit and fix it right but they are very uh, uh touchy about um uh, you know doing failure injection in actual deployment environments pre production and production environments that's like very sanctimonious to them they don't want to touch it um but one way the the chaos engineering um uh, philosophy and practice spills through is through doing fault injection on observability infra this is a low low hanging fruit so in all organizations the observability infrastructure is very critical um you might have an array of uh, tools that you are using uh, different apm solutions uh, that you might you might have employed in order to see how your system is behaving and it is really important to have them running uh, for you to be able to constantly monitor get the right alerts notifications and everything but somehow they are not in the direct path of your um, services let us say as someone providing services uh, platform services to a user base your observability infra plays as much an important role as your actual application business logic but uh, it is still a, a secondary thing it is helping someone on this side by this side i am talking about folks maintaining your infrastructure than the other side the people consuming your applications for them the application is and the availability of the applications is paramount and you are the folks who are trying to ensure it is available that's why observability is so important but people who try to adopt chaos do it on low hanging uh, targets and they typically tend to do it and this is based on uh, some experience that i have had in speaking to people um who started uh, chaos engineering adoption because we were trying to advocate it and push it and evangelize that within their org so they basically try and take down their um, prometheus for example or their alert managers or whatever services they are using for observability and then they see what is the impact um, and then they go ahead and um, uh, see what is the benefits they sort of derive out of this and then they take it to other services that probably are you can say secondary or fringe services then they take it to the main services it sort of goes from there the decision making for this often rests with the ops team the, the, the sort of devops or sre head all these kinds of 
designations or persona and percolates downwards to the teams Th- that's how it has been for a long time but it sort of changed i would say in the last um 2 3 years um yeah i i hope that sort of answered your questions uh, uh, say yeah. i i can take the next set of questions once i talk about cloud native chaos yeah yeah pretty much but i would like to request uh, would you also give us a, a practical i mean like a, a real use case which has taken like and also the mitigation which they followed to come across this kind of a uh, monkey store wide sure yeah I, i'll probably talk about um, uh, the um, adoption stories of litmus that's the tool that we are building and how some people are using it to you know actually conduct chaos engineering uh, i'll probably that might give us some idea yep sure said I, i'll do that towards the end of the uh, discussion um so, uh, going ahead we talked that uh, we said there are things changing in chaos engineering over the last 2 3 years we've been telling this in the last uh, few minutes but what it is really you, you you're all aware of the cloud native paradigm that has come about uh when you say cloud native you are um, implicitly reading it as kubernetes native because kubernetes is the really the substrate um, upon which the entire cloud native world is revolving today the first graduated project so to say within the cloud native computing foundation which is body within the linux foundation that um, is the home or repository for a lot of open source cloud native projects so what is cloud native the term itself is i'm sure a lot of you already know about it you might be building cloud native technology yourselves just uh, for the interest of uh, uh, this discussion uh, cloud native um, means a lot of things it is an approach it is a technology it is a set of principles um, so many things you, you must have heard of the 12 factor app and uh, you must have heard of the term called microservices containerization people used to host services in physical servers then they went on to hosting it in virtual machines and then they made it containerized docker became big and after it was containerized people needed an orchestration mechanism to um, manage this uh, con- containers and that's when kubernetes was built yeah, they were nomad and mesosphere and few other um, orchestration systems that were there but kubernetes became the de facto orchestration platform and why containers are important is it is probably the best way to run microservices and microservices again are um, another paradigm where uh, you used to have something called monoliths applications which um, were self contained had um, everything uh, sort of residing in one vm different functionalities or services or um, pieces of an application were sort of built together and uh, shipped as a binary earlier popularly this was known as a monolith approach and um, this got then broken down into several loosely coupled services people started calling it microservices and uh, people started developing and releasing these microservices independently and uh, there was this whole revolution about shipping fast shipping independently and integrating loosely uh, and th- th- that's the whole concept of microservices and uh, people figured out the best way to host these microservices was to run them in containers because that gives you the sameness of environment operating environment a, a ubuntu container is the same whether you run it in your laptop or whether you run it on aws so it's also a very easy way to test it ship it package it that's when containers became very uh, useful container run times became very popular docker came first followed by um, a lot of other things rkt cri container d cri wo container d a lot of things and then you had orchestration platforms to manage the availability of containers because containers were designed to be ephemeral in nature so you basically want uh, some systems to monitor how the containers are deployed and they are brought up and they are available all the time and how do you manage their life cycle how do you allocate resources to them everything so kubernetes became very popular so now this is what the cloud native world is all about a lot of organizations are rearchitecting their applications from becoming from monoliths to microservices architecture they are undergoing a change in the way they deploy the services for people to consume 
they might have done it on um, their own data centers they might have moved to cloud they might have been hybrid for some time they might they are now going to kubernetes some people are running on premise kubernetes some people are running managed services on gke and eks and azure aks everywhere and um, not only are they running their application services in a microservices way their applications in a microservices way but all the supporting supportive tooling that people used to run dns observability storage is also now can become microservices if you go to the cncf landscape you need a magnifying glass to look at it because it's all crammed into one page into several subcategories and um, there are different kinds of tooling available there so when you run your modern day application and provide it for your consumers you're most likely running it as a set of containers uh, running as pods managed by higher level controllers like deployments in stateful sets and daemon sets in kubernetes and a lot of supportive tooling that you might be running service meshes uh, containerized storage providers like open ebs or uh, gluster or um, ceph or any of these things or monitoring uh, like prometheus and grafana or dynatrace or any of these things um, maybe you are running core dns or cube dns maybe you are running uh, kafka or rabbit mq everything your message queues everything is running as different microservices so now because you are running everything in such a loosely coupled manner everything is a set of microservices which are undergoing their own patches their own upgrades their own releases and because they are running on kubernetes which is itself a very very dense platform with a lot of moving components you have a different set of control plane services running in kubernetes failure to which inhibits the working of your own app and your own services uh, so you are at the mercy of a lot of hundreds of moving components in your deployment environment to ensure that 99.95 or 99.99 availability so chaos engineering becomes much more important because the surface area for failures is that much more so this is the reality of chaos engineering in the cloud native world so what then did this influence in terms of practice people who used to advocate that things have to be shifted right run on production or pre prod environments now started saying i have done a lot of changes boss to my application i am running it on a new deployment environment i don't have the courage to run it in production right away i cannot adhere to the golden principle of chaos engineering to run chaos in production we need to take a step back and start doing lot of failure testing a lot of chaos engineering in pre production staging environments go further left run it as part of ci cd pipelines and uh, most probably as part of your cd you have your staging environment into which you are deploying and then you immediately trigger chaos experiment as a chaos test as a sanity test people would be running uh, much simpler sanity tests earlier but now the norm is to run chaos experiments as part of your sanity validation once you have done upgrades once you have deployed your new image into your production and the process of upgrading into your uh, production environment or staging environments is through um, uh, entities called gitops controllers things that keep your source and deployment environment the same uh, this is true for infrastructure the infrastructure as code as as also for your applications maintained as yamls um in your uh, git deployments you have things like argo helm flux keel a lot of these tools which ensure that your applications or infra changes are reconciled onto your deployment environment and you want to validate how good the change is you run failure tests there that's where chaos tooling is now being adopted much much more and uh, i would say chaos engineering as a practice which was very esoteric very limited to a group of people like sres and ops became much more ubiquitous and democratized and it has started seeing usefulness started seeing usage by a lot of people who are not really only sres that is developers and qa engineers and devops functions people who are building and maintaining pipelines build and release engineers a lot of people have started using chaos tooling to validate the effectiveness of changes that they are shipping to validate validate whether things are good and uh, this is where the lines between a failure test as done by qa earlier and a chaos experiment as done by the typical sre is sort of blurring of course slos continue to be validated 
but the validation of the slos also is automated and built into the experiment and uh, you basically take the hypothesis that you have and the chaos intent that you have and burn them into an experiment which is then carried out in an automated fashion let us say i we take the scenario of um doing a network loss i'm causing a, a black hole attack 100% network packet drop i'm causing to one of the services uh, let's say a balance application uh, or let's say the one of the services that provides the um a balance reader in a, in a in a payment app right i'm going to inhibit all the network traffic to that app then i'm going to see what is going to happen whether there is in, middleware intelligent enough to route it to a different replica or a different loca- different standby service or whether it fails so this validation is built in into the experiment using uh, different techniques different things called probes as they call it today in the different uh, chaos uh, tooling world and uh, there is also a huge uh, set of downstream applications whose availability we can monitor and uh, you build in all this hypothesis into the experiment you define both the chaos intent that is to cause 100% packet drop as well as the validation intent you put everything in a declarative way in a yaml and uh, then you let your gitops controllers take over push this manifest yaml manifest or experiment on your cluster and then Uh, there is some controller or reconciler that actually carries out this business that's running as a service on the cluster maybe itself running as a pod which will then carry out this chaos experiment then give you results and uh, probably push the results as metrics into some observability infrastructure which you can sort of uh, use you can probably instrument your dashboards with that information you can glean it through reports and alerts and what not this is how chaos engineering is sort of moving today and the load testing and performance tooling also plays a huge part in this when people are doing everything in pre prod and non prod environments the importance of performance tooling in chaos experimentation becomes much more and those also are burned into the experiment itself so you have one of the experiment probes launching a performance tool even as the fault is done then there is another probe which is actually monitoring for what happens when the pot is happening whether your hypothesis is proved or disproved then there is something else that is actually pushing all this metrics into an observability platform so all this is happening in an automated way so this is the change that has happened in chaos engineering over uh, a period of time and um, this is where the decision making process of how to consume chaos also is changing uh, to be a little bit more bottoms up people are uh, and especially because the, of the proliferation of chaos tooling in the open source space it used to be little, chaos monkey of course was um, open source but there was a restriction that chaos monkey can be used only with spinnaker when netflix actually created it and a lot of people who were not using spinnaker were denied the benefit of using chaos monkey and there a lot of tools sprang up in the open source space people started adopting it developers started using it sre started using it themselves and talked about its benefits uh, to their team members and they advocated it within their teams and eventually it it sort of became a policy right so that's the bottoms up adoption of technology that you see you would see with other things uh, probably let's say someone released a new editor the first consumer of that would be a developer and then slowly it sort of becomes the tool of choice for a lot of other people and then becomes a part of the uh you know the organization's um, a list of tools to subscribe to or buy licenses for and they start uh, adding that as part of their culture something very similar with chaos engineering is happening today a lot of bottoms up adoption is happening uh, there in that space and um, coming to this subcategory or term called chaos, cloud native chaos engineering uh, so this is where I, i sort of like to bring in what we are doing as a as a company as a team as a project so uh, sometime around 2018 um uh, in a company called maya data uh, we were trying to provide a, a containerized storage solution for kubernetes um basically trying to um sort of make use of uh, commodity storage available on servers and um, pull them together and create some virtual volumes and provide it attach it to containers uh, using some external storage provisioners and csi uh, controllers and things like that that's what open ebs was about 
and a lot of people were using open ebs on different cloud platforms a huge section of them were using it on hetzner cloud which is a popular uh, cloud service provider in, in europe and at the time uh, people were running into some issues there and they said that okay i'm seeing my pods get killed um, they basically move off to different nodes storage takes a long time to reconnect there my applications are facing timeouts how are you guys testing resiliency and if you're testing something why don't you share that approach with us open ebs is anyway open source why don't you share some approach with us so we can start using what you guys are using in our own deployment environments that's when litmus chaos was born to test the resiliency of open ebs and we started off doing different failures on kubernetes um network um, losses um, latency injections taking down kubernetes nodes and pods sending different kinds of termination signals eating up uh, resources uh, memory and cpu and disk stressing disks um taking nodes down for maintenance causing evictions a um, lot of th- these kind of failures we were trying to create and um, we built a project around it also open sourced it But over a period of time we saw a lot of interest getting generated for litmus and we sort of started building a roadmap dedicated to litmus chaos and not being uh, you know sort of very closely tied with open ebs because we felt any open source i mean any application uh, or any service running on kubernetes stands to benefit from litmus so we broadened its horizon and created a separate roadmap of its own it saw wide adoption and it saw contributions coming in from organizations like red hat intuit and a lot of others who started using it and then we donated cncf um, so we donated itmos chaos to cncf and um, we it, it is a sandbox project today in cncf and we've applied for incubation because we've seen a, a lot of growth in the last 1 2 years and we recently released the 2.0 of litmus to uh, provide end to end chaos engineering platform not just a tool which can help you run experiments or run faults the earlier intent was to make those faults available to people Uh, off the shelf readily usable experiments um in a declarative way people were using it on kubernetes so we wanted to give folks the same user experience that they had with kubernetes already everything is yaml everything is declarative everything is a resource and there is a controller to manipulate that resource from actual state to desired state either it is a native resource or custom resource in kubernetes so we also created chaos custom resources to define the chaos intent um in a declarative way and um, we gave, we wrote an operator that basically reconciles the chaos resource and carries out the fault injection business logic that was litmus 1.x but over a period of time as chaos engineering adoption increased as we spoke to the community learned a lot got newer requirements people wanted uh, to manage chaos across different clusters in their fleet uh, from a centralized platform centralized um, single pane of glass sort of uh, management plane rather than install custom resource definitions and operators in each cluster that they were operating and then people also needed uh, some kind of analysis on the results that were they were getting from chaos experiments people wanted this validation to be built in we said people are no longer sort of peering into their uh, uh, apm or uh, observability dashboards as they do the fault they want the system the the chaos uh, tooling or the framework to sort of validate a lot of this hypothesis that they have bring back that results and um, uh, they can de- they are free to define a set of constraints and you have result against each constraint and then an overall success factor for that experiment that they carried out and based on which they can compare the resiliency of their application or services against a particular scenario and then they compare that score the success factor that they get across environments maybe dev staging and production or maybe across releases then see how whether whether improving or or they're going down in terms of resilience etc so these are some of the capabilities that we built in um uh, into litmus 2.0 and then released it recently so that is where we are now uh, litmus chaos is the open source uh, platform and as chaos native we uh, we were part of maya data that's where litmus was born but with the popularity of litmus uh, we decided that it needs a dedicated folks resources and time so we spun off formed a new organization called chaos native just solely focused on providing enterprise support to 
litmus chaos and also um, continue to further and develop the open source litmus chaos as well so that is what we started doing as uh, chaos engineering um, people and this term called cloud native chaos was sort of coined by the maintainers of this project and it was well received and um, sort of taken to kindly by the overall uh, cloud native community and uh, the, the cloud native uh, foundation computing foundation sort of published some blogs around it um and that's where it is available now as a subcategory or rather it's recognized as a valid subcategory within chaos engineering and um the adoption of litmus has been going on for some time and uh, sid asked a question on can you give us a real use case of how somebody is using uh, chaos engineering i'll, I'll probably take the example of uh, litmus uh, tool how red hat is using it um so what they're doing is they have a platform called openshift which is uh, which is basically uh, um kubernetes at its core but with a lot of uh enhancements um and lot of management tier built on top of kubernetes so open shift control plane is being tested using uh, litmus where people are actually trying to take down uh, some of the uh, core control plane services of open shift and uh, validate whether they are able to handle it whether workloads running on open shift continue to work despite taking down the control plane services Uh, have they built an, enough redundancy in there to be able to continue running the workloads and provide the user services that's one uh, popular use case and um, there are other organizations uh, for example there is um, uh, a telco operator called orange um, and they are slowly running their network functions on kubernetes uh cloud network functions as they call them earlier it used to be vnfs uh, virtual network functions now they have started running network functions on cloud in kubernetes uh, it could be firewall something as simple as firewalls to some more complicated uh, telco services they are trying to kill um uh, or inject different kinds of faults um onto their system um they are running kubernetes on open stack and they are using litmus to do infra failures on open stack and uh, do failures in kubernetes for their cnfs and validate whether uh, they are continuing to achieve the slos that they have mostly it is testing whether their high availability works with certain constraints may they make use of something called litmus probes um in their experiment definitions and uh, those are some of the use cases about how people do mitigation um uh, i don't know if i was able to answer that part convincingly with what i just told people go back and fix either their deployment practices maybe they add more nodes they have better auto scaling policies uh, maybe they have um, more resources provided they provide the right limits for the cni as to how many ips or how many pods can run on a particular node they ensure that um, people have the right observability frameworks sometimes you are okay seeing failures but you want to be detected you want those failures to be detected quick enough and you want to be able to ensure your um, uh, your incident response is good chaos engineering is not only about testing self heal it all it's also a lot about verifying your uh, uh, readiness and incident response capabilities sometimes you are also checking people uh, resilience through chaos engineering um so how are you able to go and identify root cause based on the notifications that you are receiving and how quickly are you able to fix it how quickly you are able to get system back to operational state so that's also something that people focus on and uh, add as part of their mitigation agenda so this is uh, how people have been using chaos engineering specifically litmus and how people um, you know plan um, for uh, getting better and how they do, they do the mitigations and all these things i i hope that sort of provide a rough overview yes karthik uh, sorry to interrupt uh, so sounds like uh, it's the chaos engineering is <clears throat> meant for more beneficial for the cloud provider providers obviously google they have their own cloud pro- factory they can provide so how do you think say let's me as see as a bank i want to mm-hmm. go to kubernetes so why don't kubernet do this chaos engineering they say they come and say that yes we have come across all the chaos engineering use cases now we are good to take it 
how does uh, this sounds uh, karthik so i i feel like it went for more for uh, uh, like uh, the cloud pro- uh, of providers they has to uh, adopt and test all this chaos engineering practice and give the service to the utilizers it to a great extent they do um i think the reason why a lot of people are moving to managed kubernetes on these cloud platforms is because they are quite resilient and they are um, already doing the chaos engineering practice but you would still not leave things to chance uh, because uh, uh, the cloud is only provide and kubernetes is only providing you an infrastructure uh, to run things to an extent they can guarantee availability maybe they have things like okay you run a deployment and one of your pod goes down they can spin up another one but um, that's not as simple as it is generally because let us say you are running your own database let's say you are running postgres on um, kubernetes you have a leader follower configuration that you have set up and one of these uh, pods go down same let's say with kafka or something that you are going down one of your kafka brokers goes down on aws managed service right now depending upon the cni plugin that's being used on kubernetes the networking stack that is being used depending upon the storage that you're providing whether it's ssd whether it is normal disk depending upon the amount of cpu and memory that you have resourced your cloud instances with the time taken for failovers of let's say of your postgres or your kafka brokers might differ and also it your applications might be very complex you might be triggering of leader reelections your failovers might, might not be very straightforward there may be a lot of considerations there may be split brain scenarios that can still happen within your app context kubernetes and uh, cloud providers give you a platform to host things and they ensure basic level of resilience but on top of that there are a lot of things that can still happen depending upon what your app requirements are and um, let's say you had a 60 second timeout consumer timeout on your uh, kafka consumers and you're running it on aws and when you actually ended up running your uh, chaos experiment for doing broker failures along with a standard uh, benchmark let's say you're using locust to you know create some topics and uh, run some uh, data you see that because of the combination of uh you know different services that you're running because of the type of infra you're running and because of the choices that you've made in your deployment environment you end up seeing 75 seconds failover time and not 60 seconds so that is a learning um you might still end up facing outages or or some level of user degradation sometimes you might be as a bank let us say uh we talked about the ba- the balance survey let's say a payment gateway uh i'm i just have a console e banking application or something is there i'm able to make a deposit and uh, i can also make payments digital payments now when i go make a digital payment it has to read the balance services to see how much amount i have left in my bank before i'm able to make the payment now if i go ahead and inject 60 seconds or like, let's say some uh, 60 seconds is just too much it will time out something like 2000 or 5000 milliseconds latency on the balance reader service now there is going to be a um, you know your front end service speaking to that guy to find out if there's enough money and there's that that operation is going to be now stalled by this much time that might actually bubble up to your end user with much higher latency so you have you have some latency injected into your back end service that sort of builds up 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 across several layers and by the time as a user you see what's happening on your screen you're seeing that rotate button sh- run for much longer than you anticipated so the way your uh, the more complex your um, uh, infra is the more uh, network complexities especially your infra involves the more the impact of faults and um, it's cannot be left to the cloud provider to you know guarantee resilience under all circumstances for all scenarios they will provide a certain level of resilience in in hosting your services but how certain faults propagate to the end user is something you have to find out and uh, if if it uh, were that good a lot of people would still not be doing chaos engineering um, on cloud platforms but the fact that they are doing it today sort of reflects this reality in fact 
AWS in the recent reInvent launched the FIS, fault injection, uh, fault injection service. It is a paid service on AWS to do for chaos engineering. They are encouraging their users to do chaos engineering because they believe there is a lot of dynamism that is brought in by people who are deploying their applications and um, they need to do chaos engineering. Azure launched the Azure Chaos Studio just on 16th August. So cloud providers are encouraging people to do chaos engineering. And um, uh, I think it is still going to be needed. It cannot be left to the provider to ensure that everything is going to be up all the time. So they will make that uh, possible to a good extent. And a lot of people find it very difficult to you know, run things in the cloud all the time because it eats up a lot of money. So they have on-premise infrastructure. You build your own private clouds, OpenStack, VMware, or you have some hybrid model. Um, you're running some uh, high-touch services on the cloud maybe, and your uh, your other services are running in, in-house in your own data centers. So it becomes necessary for you to sort of um, run chaos engineering in places where it matters more. And also you have people running um, federated clusters across several availability zones or regions to, avail- to maintain availability. So sometimes, um, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of latency that is creeping in Let's say you're running a synchronous service, um, a synchronous replication between your services, and your service is running on different regions because you want high availability. That's going to add a lot of latency. And now, even if you say 0.1x latency is injected there, it bubbles up into 100x by the time it sort of reaches the customer. The user experience is degraded far beyond what you injected in between. So you need to have a lot of intelligence in your middleware um, and chaos engineering is a lot about learning. It's uh, That's also one place where it differs from regular failure testing. You learn a lot. There's something called unknown unknowns. So when you build your hypothesis, there's something called known known, known unknown, and then there are unknown unknowns. When somebody builds an app, uh, builds a service, uh, a tool, or a platform, you account for a unlimited bandwidth, zero latency, lot of uh, compute resources, unlimited storage, but that's not often the case. You might run out of capacity. Your storage might get disconnected. Uh, There might be media errors on the storage and your disk reads and writes might become very slow. There are so many factors that can creep in, which one might not have accounted for. And those things can be sort of uh, seen and found out when you do your experiments um, and you learn a lot out of it. And then you go back to the drawing board, fix either your infrastructure, your deployment practice, maybe you are going to run more replicas, maybe you're going to put a better load balancer, or maybe you're going to fix actual bug in the application software. Uh, You know, that's something that you might do as well. There are different ways in which people might mitigate and um, chaos engineering sort of continues to be important even, uh, you know, even in the the so-called cloud environments where generally things are more resilient because they are doing some testing on your behalf already. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Karthik. Can we take a couple more questions, Karthik? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mrunal, uh, do you have any question? Yeah, um, thanks, Naveen. Hi, Karthik. Mrunal here. Hi, Mrunal. Yeah, Karthik, I wanted to understand uh, how frequently uh, do you, uh, since you have been in this space for quite some time now, how frequently do you uh, think these experiments should be done? And uh, should uh, should the experiment experiments include multiple parameters, or should one parameter to, uh, be tested at a time? Like you mentioned about networking, right? So should that uh, yeah. uh, should one experiment include only networking, the next one only storage, like that? What what is? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Rinal. Um, you are right. Uh, how frequent is it? Is uh, I think depends upon the the organization and uh, depends upon how mature their applications are. Uh, there are people who conduct game days, um, uh, monthly game days and things like that. But there are also people who do chaos experiments every day. Um, I, I would recommend having chaos experiments run in an automated fashion as part of your delivery pipelines and make it very frequent, uh, especially if you are microservices oriented and you're putting things on Kubernetes. 
because there's a lot of change happening there. And if you've uh, set up automated builds and if you're in the practice, if you, if you have the practice of deploying uh, uh, or upgrading your dependencies often, then it becomes important to do chaos engineering that much more frequently. So I would say you know, too, too much is better than less. On um, how do you actually run the test? Do you usually target a single variable? Do you target multiple? Good to start with single. In fact, if you look at the principles of chaos uh, that Netflix and uh, team and folks sort of put up initially, the thing they said was minimize blast radius. So you are trying to make the failure as controlled as possible. Chaos engineering is a very scientific discipline. Despite the name uh, chaos, you make very controlled failures and see how it behaves. So you start off with single parameter, single variable changes and observe behavior. And once you have built up enough knowledge on how the system is going to behave to a certain fault, you do things in combination. So one of the things we start, one, one feedback we received as we did the Ritmus Open Source project was um, we moved from doing simple experiments to workflows. Ritmus 1.x was all about experiments and Ritmus 2.x is a lot about workflows where you can string together different faults in desired order. Um, you can do faults in parallel because when misfortune happens, it doesn't happen singly uh, in, in, in real world. So you also do multiple faults, but that is done after you've sort of understood how things behave to single uh, component failures. So you start off with single variable faults, and then you sort of move to multi-component failures and observe how the system is behaving. I think that's the uh, process it would start frequently with uh, test environments and CI CD pipelines. Then you, you graduate to doing it in pre prod and production. When you go to production, obviously it becomes uh, um, uh, few and far in between. It becomes more periodic, uh, uh, you know, often at uh, larger intervals rather than doing it very frequently. It also depends on the environment uh, that you're doing it in. So in production, it would, of course, be you know, with uh, enough gap between uh, two game days, as they would call it. Whereas, you know, staging, pre-prod, and test, you tend to do it more frequently. Start off with a single component and graduate to multi-component failures. Thanks, Karthik. Yeah, Shilpa, do you have any question? Uh, yes, Navin, I do have. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for arranging this session. It's in, it's very insightful. Uh, so my question goes, uh, how is a chaos a different than performance testing and engineering? Since we have different types of testing types or scenarios, which we usually do in our performance testing as well. So what's the additional feature we have in chaos engineering? Okay, so performance testing, um... I think has a lot of objectives um, uh, as you do them. Uh, one of the things that you would end up doing as part of a performance test or a benchmark test is load the system really high, right? Uh, just saturate it with requests. That is also a form of chaos, you can say. In principle, um, philosophically, that is also um, uh, inflicting chaos. But tra traditionally, chaos involves failures, uh, whereas it is not something that is a mandatory thing when you do performance tests. You benchmark systems, you run uh, performance tools, you visualize how different parameters uh, sort of come through and um, how they change in relation to each other. I come from a storage background uh, a little bit, so the performance tests that we used to do on uh, our uh, storage systems involved running with different block sizes, for example. Run um, 4K, 8K, 256K, 1M kind of block sizes, run sequential and random workloads, run uh, for different active durations, cache warmed up without the cache warmed up, write cache right through, all sorts of things, and see how the system behaves. You understand a lot about how efficiently and how quickly you are able to serve requests and the multiple dimensions of that how quick. Right? There is latency, there is throughput and IOPS that we used to sort of view as the three pillars of storage performance. I'm sure that it, it differs depending upon the target or object against which the performance test is being performed. 
it's a lot about how uh, quickly you are able to sort of um, uh, respond to requests and how efficiently you are able to do it. That's generally the goal of performance testing. But often as part of that, you also take the system to the saturation point and see whether it is able to work or no, which is also, you know, sort of a, a chaos test. But traditionally, chaos is associated with going one step further and degrading your system by failing some component. You would, you would be injecting a network loss. You would be taking down a disk. You would be taking down a compute instance and let, let, let your system would optimally work in a four node cluster load balanced across four nodes, but you reduce it to two nodes and see really what is happening. And um, you, you, you are probably um, creating noisy neighbor conditions. Let us say your system is performing at a certain level. You introduce some rogue processes and eat up resources and leave your actual process with very less CPU cycles to work with or with less system memory to work with. So these are the uh, deliberate faults that you're injecting in your system even as you're running your load to see what happens, right? A chaos engineering is involves to a great extent um, these kind of uh, yeah. things. Injection of faults along with the actual performance profiles being run and system behavior being observed. That's how I would uh, sort of uh, uh, look at it. Okay, thank you so much for the answer. So, Karthik, I have one more question. Yeah. Yeah, is it possible to take out the entire region uh, by doing chaos engineering? I think those, yes. Um, yes, those kind of tests are practiced. Um, I, I have heard of, um, uh, there's a chaos King Kong or a chaos gorilla or some such thing that Netflix, Netflix provides, which actually enables you to do things like that. Take down availability zones, regions. Um, I have not personally experimented with that. Uh, so Litmus started off as chaos engineering within a Kubernetes context and then grew on to starting to do Kubernetes against a non, I'm sorry, starting to do chaos engineering against non-Kubernetes infrastructure while still running the business logic within Kubernetes. So that means you have the uh, Litmus control plane running as a service, a set of services or microservices on Kubernetes. But we're making use of the AWS Go SDK, the VMware and the GCP and Azure SDKs to sort of uh, use their APIs to go and uh, do out of band and in VM, in instance failures. We are working on providing um, those kind of capabilities, simulate AZ failures and things like that. But um, yeah, those kind of tools do exist. Um, we, we are also in the process of expanding our uh, suite to include things like that. But, but uh, that is also a practice, but that's something you wouldn't really try um, unless you're really sure of your applications and uh, how they are working. Correct. Thank you. We have Rakesh. Hi, Rakesh. Do you have any question? Uh, yes, Navin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for pulling me up. Uh, Karthik, thank you so much for the insights. Uh, uh, it's really helpful. And uh, uh, I got a question, and I'm not sure, like, you know, you would have already covered this. So there is a failover testing, and uh, uh, now we are talking about the uh, chaos in uh, testing. So what what is the main difference, like how it is very different uh, to the regular failover testing? And also, is it something that we use for the disaster uh, recovery as well? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Rakesh. So there is um, a slight difference to testing and chaos experimentation, but it's more of a very subtle philosophical difference, Rakesh. Failure, failover testing is generally a part of the chaos engineering agenda for a lot of people in different companies. So there is a, the tool that you're using to inflict this failure can be bent any which way. You can use it to perform a failover test if you would, would like to look at it that way or you can use it to perform a chaos experiment now what is the difference between these two many times when you do testing or the traditional uh, failover test or a system test you you have a predefined hypothesis which is mostly about the how of the application how it is behaving uh, you may or may not be really looking at the slos as part of the process of running the test. Whereas chaos experiment is um, 
less about the how and it's more about the what and um, there's there's something called exploratory testing that we might all have come across in our journey uh, people say okay there are some test suites that we all wrote up in the in our alms and then we go and test it and fill up results and do all that but then there is this um, exploratory testing that we do things we sort of did not document really but we gave ourselves some time to sort of understand the project try out something with sort of idea of this is what might happen but let us see what happens because we are learning something new the chaos experimentation is falls the traditional definition of chaos experimentation falls in that latter category you are uh, seeing the end behavior the user behavior you are often peering into the slos you might have set up thresholds on your dashboards you are seeing whether that guy is breached or no and if he if he is breached then how quickly is it coming back mttr is very important does your self feel really work um so those are the kind of things that you would look but from a tooling point of view you would use the same tool you can bend it any which way you can use it for doing your regular testing you can use it for experimentation you, all these kind of things that would be the uh, the subtle difference i think you had a second part to the question as well um, could you please repeat that i think i just lost it yeah so i didn't mention thanks uh, for that uh, uh, i did mention about the disaster uh, recovery as well yeah 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 so disaster recovery uh, verifying whether that is really working is also one of the things you would do as as part of an experiment um it's probably a later stage experiment i would say uh, you would be uh, starting with uh, uh, testing high availability uh, so ha and dr are two aspects of resilience uh, typically um, uh, the ha is defined as let's say you have an active and uh, passive uh, system a passive uh, controller or service residing within your uh, deployment environment and um, it's generally associated with inline failovers uh, active failovers uh, what i mean is you don't really need any manual intervention and things happen on the fly whereas disaster recovery is generally associated and these are all very porous terms disaster recovery in many parts many organization uh, talks about having a golden copy which is undergoing some kind of asynchronous replication and then you promote it to become the primary with some uh, admin approval or uh, some promotion process that you would do either manually or automatically depending upon now what's happening with your primary site whereas ha is more like probably within a site you have active and passive uh, components and you're, you're bringing up immediately when one thing is going down so i think you start off with chaos experiments that validate high availability and then there are chaos experiments which also uh you know talk about disaster recovery most of these region level failures and whatever we are talking can um sort of be those kind of experiments um the ones that validate dr even if there is a manual effort involved in promoting a dr site as active um there, there is uh, there there are some sla is involved there how quickly as a team you can promote it and how quickly you get on to the right metrics or performance on the the now a promoted system uh, so that's also something that you try to take away from a chaos experiment so yes that's also something that you would do in a chaos experiment maybe let's say a day two chaos experiment rather than a day zero or a day one chaos experiment yeah thanks karthik Thank so uh, we are here we are everyone uh, in this group right uh, everybody into performance testing and engineering so how can we become a chaos engineer so what kind of skills we need to have what kind of tools we have to learn any insights on that karthik i think uh, you are already in at, at an advantage because unlike developers uh, or maybe uh, you know specific qa teams be nowadays the qa teams are like sort of very tied with the components developers are building in all the agile world so you are already in an advantage because you're looking at the system um you look at it from a system perspective already uh closer to the way an end user would look um when you're a performance engineer so that's a great beginning 
and there is a lot of uh, uh, tooling available today um, there are some tooling which have internal chaos engineering plugins for example you take neo load or you take dynatrace and this is a trend that's catching up now a lot of observability um, providers a lot of apm providers vendors which is what you might be dealing with on a day to day basis provide some chaos engineering hooks where you can launch experiments from the dash their own dashboards um to see what happens when a system uh, fault is injected as you run your um, load profiles as you run your performance tests that's one easy path uh but there are a lot of open source tools um i, I understand there are there are a lot of people even use open source performance uh tooling uh, not necessarily enterprise uh, tooling and uh, not all enterprise tooling has uh, these chaos plugins you have a lot of tools today um with great documentation great um resources examples case studies that you can start utilizing if you are on kubernetes um uh, you you have a lot of them even if you are not on kubernetes and if you are in a sort of pre kubernetes infrastructure even there there are there are a lot of tools available um which 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 sort of help you to start injecting some simple failures and many of these tools that are available today let us included have some kind of um hooks into the uh, observability platform uh, th by this i'm not talking about the ability to launch experiments from those apm uh, tools that i mentioned few minutes back but you have the ability to export metrics let's say a uh, lot of these tools cloudwatch or dynatrace or grafana um sort of which is what you might be using as part of your runs uh, to visualize impact even as you run load from other tools uh, in your uh, in your suite the chaos tools export metrics or uh, export events or uh, provide some way of visualizing your uh, impact of the chaos experiment on the application on these dashboards we call it as interleaved chaos dashboards grafana dashboards in litmus uh, we we provide a plugin but um, that's true for a lot of other tools as well so you can sort of run your load run your fault using these tools and you make use of these hooks to view things in those dashboards um yeah i think to uh, to give a short answer you, you can start making use of a lot of open source tooling that is available around chaos engineering um coming from litmus i would um, uh, um sort of request you all to take a look at it um we have something called chaos workflows which is a distinct advantage um compared to some of the other tools available today and in when workflows you can actually bring in a load job along with a fault job tie them together and run it and then see the impact of chaos on your application dashboards um we are in the process of adding more probes we work with we work we have kts probes and uh, bash probes prometheus probes all all these kind of things to validate steady state hypothesis we're trying to add more such probes where we try to engage with more standardized um uh you know performance tools that are out there maybe k6 or locust or uh, vegeta tools like this where you can go ahead and define a profile that you probably standard would be using uh, in, in a standard manner in your tests now you can define that as part of a litmus workflow also tie together fault with it and then run it and see so yeah you could use a lot of open source tooling um, we are very much aligned and um, uh, very much tuned to the needs of the performance community uh, as the uh, litmus uh, group and we are trying to create more capabilities there for you to make use of so yeah there are some good pieces yeah. thanks karthik hey karthik uh, i have one one last quick question like uh, so this fault injections right so uh you have categorized into three categories known knowns known unknowns and known unknowns so you as yeah. a litmus you do have a set of standards of uh, faults made that uh, for the, for any application or any organization and second question is 
so how often you think we need to repeat the same uh, fault injection so once it is mitigated we uh, can can we ignore that uh, uh, fault injection and we can continue with another thing right yeah so on the, on the first question uh, litmus has ready made uh, or off the shelf experiments or faults uh, for kubernetes and for um, some cncf projects like open ebs and also for some applications like cassandra postgres and kafka some native faults with some um, uh, you know application specific hypothesis health checks that are embedded within the experiments we are expanding that suite uh, it also now has ability to do faults on azure gcp um, aws vmware vms and uh, ebs and GC- gpd disks all these kind of things data stores and vmware and all that so there are some ready made faults that you can use uh, on the second question um, yeah as part of a game day or as part of let's say uh, chaos experimentation run you run the fault see if it is mitigated already then you move to the next fault or if not you fix things come back execute it then you find out it has been mitigated then you move on to the next fault that that process is something that you would do uh, in one installment and then they would actually repeat it because your deployment environment is not going to remain the same your application might have undergone upgrades or your infra might have undergone upgrades you might have upgraded kubernetes versions or you might have upgraded uh, to a different node type uh, you, you might have made some os patches that might have some impact as there may be a kernel version change uh, or you might have um, have gone ahead and um, made some fixes to your application in response to a fault that you had last time and maybe that is caused some regression of something else so this is very similar to testing i said so chaos experimentation you 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 identify a set of chaos experiments as part of your sanity run very similar to your regression suites uh, non failure regression suites that you would do and repeat them in an automated fashion but you go and keep increasing the level of failure let us say you did a single component failure like uh, mrunal was asking some time back you start off with one variable you find out that you're you you've been able to you know identify the right um, mitigation you, you've built in self healing and your automation is also yielding uh, success for that experiment um, every time you run it you basically level up and go to the next fault where you create a more complex scenario and the hypothesis also uh, correspondingly becoming more complex and uh, you are basically running that experiment which sort of has a subset uh, of the previous fault plus another one then you identify what happens there and then you go from there so i would say you need to repeat the chaos experiment it also is important it you, you might also have other incentives for repetition uh, you might have changed you might have migrated from one cloud to another cloud or you might have migrated from one uh, platform dependency other platform dependency for example you might have changed your choice of db you might have gone from mongo to something else or you might have been mongo you, you might have been using one uh, vendor's version of mongo db and then you might move to another version of mongo db you might have changed the operator that's taking care of mongo so so, so many things that can keep undergoing changes so you you would tend to repeat some experiments that you've identified slowly some of these experiments keep getting into the bucket of your regression or sanity ones do you keep identifying newer ones that sort of make use of that fault plus another one to create a more complex scenario but generally you would tend to repeat it thanks uh, thanks kartik so uh, kartik you conduct workshops right so by any chance uh, it is scheduled uh, in the soon uh, upcoming workshops yeah so um we do conduct workshops as chaos native the org behind open source litmus and um you can register for a work- workshop there is one that is the, the first one that we conducted some days back um there's another one coming up very soon you can go to the chaos native website um and you will find the option to register for a workshop Uh, the workshop is um, mostly going to be about 
you know a, a repetition a little bit of what we discussed today of chaos engineering its history and practice but it's also a lot about how you can use the chaos native enterprise platform built on litmus open source project to conduct chaos experiments and um, glean information and you, you know sort of get started okay sorry so yes, we, we do conduct workshops i would encourage you to register and uh, we'll be happy to uh, sort of uh, um, sort of get you kick started on the chaos engineering journey so how can we contact you kartik if someone has any questions yeah um i am uh, available on um, my mail id i'll probably share it it's kartik.s at chaosnative.com um and i'm also on twitter my handle is at k satchit that is at k s e t c h i t um i am um, please hit me up on linkedin as well i'm kartik satchidanand on linkedin um so please feel free to connect i would love to connect with you all and uh, keep in touch and uh, there's a lot that we as chaos engineering community i know that today was a little bit of a one sided conversation where uh, uh, we were speaking a lot about chaos and and how it ties in with how performance testing and performance benchmark tools can be leveraged within in a chaos experimentation context but we stand to learn a lot from hearing uh, you experts on on performance i'm really looking forward to um, sort of listening in on more um, uh, more discussions that um, navin and you all are putting together on performance engineering and uh, sort of take those learnings and you know, make a better chaos engineering platform take those learnings back to litmus and chaos native yeah thanks kathi actually a lot of information to process in past 90 minutes so that is why session is being recorded it will be published in my uh, youtube channel probably you can also uh, send a note or you can put a reference in your uh, community also people can refer uh, the recordings sure that would be great so if no one has any questions then we can conclude the session many thanks karthik uh, it was very insightful so if we, you brought up a new whole new perspective about the testing and chaos <laughs> so it will be very helpful for us to do something to get started at least in our project so thanks for that and uh, yeah. we are we will uh, uh, anyway register for the workshops and then we'll try to uh, learn a lot of things from the websites you uh, referred i will also put a note in my github repository uh, you can also make a reference thank you everyone uh, if you, have, if you don't have any questions yeah we can wind up many thanks karthik again hope to you uh, hope uh, we see you again soon yep looking forward to being here thank you so much for uh, organizing this and uh, cheers everyone bye thank thanks, you karthik. have a good weekend have a good night thank you uh, see you bye thank you good night